So welcome to Northern Powerhouses, our business success story series of interviews where we discuss with the local business leaders, their backgrounds, their successes and challenges, and what's really driving them forwards. And today I'm delighted to have with us Claire Lowson of the Propaganda Agency. And Claire, firstly, uh, thank you for coming on board and, and, and uh, agreeing to be interviewed. And if you'd like to introduce yourself and the agency to the audience and what you do and how you help people, that would be great. Lovely, thank you. Hello, Chris, nice to be here. So uh, propaganda, a propaganda brand strategy is our kind of founding business that is uh, a brand, a strategic and creative agency that people come to for various reasons. So it might be that you have, uh, you want to launch a new business, you're a startup, it might be that you are uh, successful, you've, you've begun successfully, but you now want to cement and grow your brand. Yep. It might be that you're ready to exit. Um, in all those cases, we offer transformation and real results. So it's very much about business. It's not, we're not an ad agency. We're not a web agency. We are a strategic agency. We're the only brand agency to be a member of the Management Consultancy Association, which is relevant. I think it says a lot about the way in which we work yes. uh, and the kind of proven expertise. But prop agency, the bit that we're talking about today, is uh, our new service division that is really focused on age, hence the agency. And yep. that is because we see a real opportunity in the kind of um, old age brand space. And that is something that I am madly passionate about and have been since being quite a young person. I don't think that age is just for the old, I think all of us, no, in my in my kind of experience, nobody wants to die young. Yep. We've probably all lost friends young and we know yes. how tragic that is. So we all want to, to reach age and yet we kind of um, denigrate it and we're yep. repulsed by it potentially. We don't, we, we worry about it, we fear it. It's not cool basically. And I think at the moment there's clearly um, much more appetite for this. We've got an aging population. Uh, the the kind of baby boomer generation or you know the gen X, gen X coming through are much more demanding about the way that the world treats them and so yep. there is a shift and um, and our opinion is that it's yeah it's ripe for a rebrand age is ripe for a rebrand and I have always been interested in doing that and find myself in this fortunate position to be here um, within propaganda with the kind of remit to do that there's yep. also obviously a kind of intersection with age and menopause for, for women not just for women I mean menopause is relevant for everyone but yep. there's obviously there's a bit of a zeitgeist at the moment around menopause and there's yep. a real kind of building traction in that area we are the um, strategic agency behind Gen M uh, generation menopause who are uh, have been in in business now establishing a fantastic offer where they partner with big brands and the um the kind of principle of that and does is that the brand space is it really poorly represents yep. age so typically with menopause branding not that there is much but if you ever see a bbc article with a picture of a menopausal woman, she'll have her head in her hands and look very kind of grey and defeated. And if you see yes. a product for menopause, that's often the way too. So either that or it's some smiling, rather grey-haired, kind of frumpy-looking person. Yep. So I think brands pro probably understandably fight shy of that space because they don't see it as glamorous. It, I would say, I mean, glamorous is not quite the right word, but um, it's an aspirational space to play in because... Yep. Women, you know, women really become perimenopausal, so they start that kind of process in their early 40s. And, and we all know that women in their early 40s are, are on the up with a, a long way to go and decades, decades yep. ahead. So I think, um, yeah, you know, it's not anymore about age. Menopause might have been about age at one point. It, it, it isn't anymore. And um there's loads of fantastic stats that I can give you if you're interested, but Forbes refer to uh, women over 50 as being super consumers. They, they hold like the purse strings, they have purchasing power for 97% of their household. They're making big purchasing decisions. And women under 40 are now out earning and out spending women over 40, sorry, women over 40 are out spending yep. and out earning yep. women under 40 for the first time ever. And that's a, that's a really powerful shift. So yeah, we've got that kind of menopause 
kind of space that we're yes. playing and the bigger the bigger kind of um rebound rebrand age push that we're interested in in as well and, and obviously yeah the, there's some overlap but ultimately i think even though it might be very much led by women with this kind of menopause appetite i think it'll do it'll benefit everyone because it's for the good of all of us men and women that actually we aspire to be in a very healthy old age mckinsey did a big piece recently that showed that longevity is going up and we're all living a lot longer um men and women and the differential between men and women is is getting less actually but that research showed that globally we're living a much bigger portion of our life in ill health because we're not looking after ourselves and the society isn't necessarily structured to help us look after ourselves in the way that we need to to enjoy those extra years kind of feeling good so yes. um yeah, there's a lot of a lot of interesting things going on in this space at the moment. Yeah, I, I can imagine. It's fascinating um, talking to you about this. It, and has the last two or three years of, of COVID and lockdown changed anything in terms of perception or branding? Or have you seen anything specifically related to the change in our lifestyles or, or you know, work styles, I guess? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I think COVID... COVID proved that change can happen fast because pre-COVID, everybody said, no, you know, we can't have a, a, a kind of society where everybody works from home. We can't, the IT is not there to support that. We know that's wrong. It flipped yeah. and flipped practically overnight. So, you know, systems worked that everybody had said wouldn't work. So changes can be made fast. And the McKinsey report absolutely refers to that, actually. I think COVID also has raised um, issues around people wanting flexibility and wanting yeah. to be better served, better looked after by their businesses, and also the kind of mental health agenda. Um, or the well-being agenda and interestingly I think it was a Harvard Business Review piece that said that when you try and focus on well-being but you you look at too many kind of focal points for the business it becomes quite blurred and difficult for people to really get behind if you choose one focal point uh, it's much easier to to be successful and our feeling very much with menopause at the moment is that it, it is a is potentially a new lever for organizational success because you can strategically build out from that we know that you know women are leaving business in droves at this age yes. and businesses can't afford to lose them and if they want yep. gender balance boards if we want you know, uh, the gender pay gap to reduce all of that. We need to keep those women in business. Then our industry, like brand and marketing needs, we need women at this age in business in order to help the brands position properly for this space. So it's a virtuous circle. Um, and, and we would argue that really any strategic kind of driver around menopause now could be really successful. Great, great. Yeah. Be really interesting, yeah. I mean, uh, I, now I, I, I guess if I'm perfectly flat, it wasn't something I thought of until we've had this conversation as a specific issue. But it'll be, yeah, I'll be uh, thinking about things as as I move forward now about how that relates to uh, myself and and people around me. I think it relates in, you know, you kind of, if you think about cultural platforms, about transparency, communication, a, being um, encouraged to bring your kind of you know um when you're not feeling good to work as well as you are you know all of that you can see yep. how using it as one area kind of does um you know overlap and connect with other and also i think for women it's like you know you you perimenopause which is the beginning stage starts in your early 40s you're probably only just back at work after having kids yep. so you have your children you navigate maternity you navigate the early years of childcare, part-time working, all yep. of those demands, and you're just settling back into your stride and really thinking about hitting the big time when this hits. Yes. So, um, I mean, I think it's relevant for all women. And I think the more education there is, the more kind of mentoring, coaching, support, all of that given. And the more a company big up this like age group of women, w women feel, you know, they have to deny being this age and they have to you know everything everything in the brand industry is about looking young it doesn't yes. work for women you know, men can like hold the hand up and go yeah I'm, 
I'm getting gray and I'm, I'm like into my fifties and I'm only going to get more powerful. Whereas women, it's like, oh, behind closed doors, it's completely um, negative. And so then women kind of don't feel that they can confidently be their experience and their power, because of course women get more powerful as they get older, just the same as men, but they are somehow in this weird place of like, oh, I am that age and I have got my 30 years of experience and I have got that power and clout and gravitas and I can sit in the boardroom. And yet at the same time, you know, you, you're kind of supposed to be, you know, looking like you're still 25. Yeah. It's yeah. No, it makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Um, it, 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 would you tell us a little bit more about your specific background and how you got into business and why, why this particular one? I could tell you, obviously, very passionate about it. Yeah, I'm, well, my background is a brand strategist yeah. uh, uh, and a coach. I've worked in both, and the, the two overlap quite often because you will often end up kind of coaching a board if you've gone in from a kind of strategic point of view. And I've coached a lot of women, particularly women with their own objectives to getting up the career ladder or um, optimizing potential. I'd say optimization is my real thing. I've just got this thing about anything that I come across, I want it to be at its optimum. So I've always been interested in health and well-being from being a child. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, but back when I was really small, my mum got this diary every year that arrived. I think it was from like the Milk Marketing Board or the Dairy, British Dairy Association or something. But it had healthy, like, it was a partnership made with the British Heart Foundation. It had like this healthy bit in it about what yep. you should do to be healthy. And I loved it. So I'd get all my friends going around on those like space hoppers or on their bikes and I'd time them and make them do laps and all sorts. Because I always was interested in getting everybody to be the best they could be. So I think that's really my starting point to arrive many years later here. Um, and then I taught when I first left, when I left university, there was a recession. I was supposed to do an MA and the, the tutor was sick and it was postponed for a year. So I did a PGCE at Cambridge, which was brilliant. And I went into a really good school in London. Um, but was struck quite early on by this kind of challenge for, for girls and women that even, you know, girls of 12 could com come into school on a non-uniform day looking really like they could have passed for 20. And it's alarming and wrong and kind of they're over-sexualized and it's discomforting and, it, you know, as a parent, you wouldn't advocate for that. And then... And then they are 18 and then they're like 25 and suddenly by 25 they're like you know worrying about aging and i employed when i was in my 40s i employed a woman who was 26 and having botox and liposuction and worrying you know she's 26 yeah. years old so and then through my career i felt like you you know i worked I was, because I've been a teacher, I was really happy presenting to big audiences. And I worked on the Millennium Dome um, for a company called Imagination, which was a brilliant, brilliant business where I learned everything, really. Wow. Our client was BT, and BT were doing the talk zone in, in the Dome. And yeah. my boss was on holiday. There was a big presentation, and, you know, it was me that was going to do it. But the client was worried. They were like, well, she's... She might be in a, whatever I was, you know, late 20s, but she looks really young and what is she going to wear? And all these questions that never, ever would have been put to a young man. Yeah. So, um, and, and then it's like, so you're kind of too young to be taken seriously, but then you're too fertile to be taken seriously because you're going to have your babies now. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, you're juggling all of the, the children. And then suddenly, oh God, she's like, perimenopause and menopausal that's a nightmare so I guess for me you know going through my career and now looking back a bit I think when is the the ideal time so my work has only now started to be specifically in this area but in all my kind of life as a first a teacher then a brand strategist and a coach and optimizing brands this is there's always been this overlap somehow that there's something there around health and well-being and Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, even at Imagination, I was pushing for them to invest in kind of like, you know, now we can see it as farmers markets and organics become really big. But I yep. think quite early, early on, I was uh, really keen on on all of that 
stuff as well just a kind of natural healthy way of of being yeah. and uh, yeah so I guess that's kind of it's come pretty full circle now to where I am now so uh, what are some I mean obviously you've identified some there but some of the key challenges you've had to overcome are there any that really stick out in your mind uh, I, other than the, uh, the the presentation of uh, in the millennium now um I think just yeah similar being taken seriously in a in a world where you know there was one there was no woman on the board at imagination I loved imagination brilliant company no women on the board um, then there was one woman on the board um, just having that sense of you know things can kind of they can quite quickly turn against you if you're in a an unrepresented minority I think yes. that you know as a white middle class white man you don't really have a sense of that I think as a white woman we've got far less sense of that than other people but it's still there as a woman yeah. and you, I have often felt like I've been playing in a man's world I've been in um, board many many meetings with me being the only woman in the room um, yeah thinking about that like I went through a period where I really felt I think the people that I was working for were very tall so my own the team that I was with were very tall men yeah I would sometimes be in the office and if a meeting came up an impromptu meeting I'd be like oh god I do want to go and get some kind of trousers and high heels because I just want to have the same stature yeah. so strange things really I suppose but um yeah I guess they're the main the main the yeah. main challenges I think and just I think that I've had a portfolio career perhaps before that was a very popular thing which yep. brought its own challenges and I'm really glad that I've done that it's meant that I really always advocate for doing what you love and yep. um so and I wanted my parents had their own business I grew up with a lot of freedom in the school holidays we would we, I never knew that world where you know your dad comes and puts on his suit and goes off in the morning before you're up and comes back in the evening in the school holidays we would go with my dad to a meeting in Edinburgh or wherever it might be and we'd sit in the car with books or comics or playing cards I mean you'd, I guess you wouldn't be allowed to do that now and then we'd, um, when he finished his meeting, we'd just go to Holy Island or, you know, wherever we would be and, mm -hmm. and have a nice kind of afternoon out. So, yeah. you know, that, I guess freedom is a real value of mine. And yeah. so for a lot of the time, I've kind of contracted into companies as well as being properly in there. And that's got its own challenges, but it's let me find my way and com constantly kind of um, be doing what I love. I guess really? I think it's important. I think it really is. It's so um, you know we spend so much time in work, in business, whatever, in whatever, and it 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 must be really terrible to be in something we don't really love. And and, and ultimately, if we're not enjoying it, we're not going to be really very effective. It's very difficult to be highly productive and effective if we're not enjoying what we do. I appreciate some people can, but obviously, um, I think it's Brian Tracy talks about the most successful organizations are the ones where most people spend most of the time doing the three things they really love and they're really good at and it, and it, and it sort of it no it's a clearly very sensible common sense i'm not sure it happens that often though i don't think it does and i think that's yeah. really true because i ran a program for lloyd's tsb at one point that was about kind of taking their senior leaders to the next level they were it was a kind of came at a point when they might have had options of early retirement but that wasn't really going to happen anymore so how can you get them to the next level and we did a lot of work around motivation and innovation and creativity and pr we put a lot of things in that they've not really had but it was still clear that in that in that career path it was about everybody being good at everything Yep. And, so, and that for me is crazy and my son started school two years ago and I've really been surprised at how kind of viscerally I feel against a lot of what goes on because it does feel like I mean I know schools are bound by the national curriculum their hands are tied it's a much more regimented rigid process than than when I went which is mad because the world isn't. I mean, the, the world for me now, children need to come out of school and be change makers and be creative and start their own businesses and be confident to challenge and to, to make yep. new, new stuff happen. They're not going to go into solid employment for the next you know, 50 years and get a golden handshake. It's not that world. And yet 
it, there still seems to be a lot of focus on conforming and you know wear the uniform and do what you're told and you know I think the whole um, homeschooling thing really took off after Covid because people and I've got friends near me in the village where I live that homeschool and they said that they have a tutor for their girls an hour a week and I went I said you know to the dad I was like you mean an hour a day and he went no an hour a week the rest of the time is them learning by just doing stuff yeah. and I think that's fascinating when you think about how much time is spent at school yep. that what are they doing because we can't send them in to do music and drama and sport and all the other things that we might love them to do because there isn't any time because they're at school for eight hours a day yep. six hours a day so yeah I think there's a lot a lot of kind of for biz for business for me like you say it would be a great world where everybody is encouraged from the get-go from like 5 11 and into adulthood to really know what they do well and do it as opposed to having to do a lot of stuff that they really know that they don't like doing and they don't do well and spending a lot of time doing that and wasting all those yeah. like that talent that could be developed Mate. Makes perfect sense. But makes perfect sense. I'd love to see that happen. I don't yeah. know how. Uh, yeah, I, I really would. Um, and, and obviously, throughout, throughout your career, what would you say some of the most important things you've learned about business in general? Uh, I think that really do kind of do what you love. I think when yep. you look at brand brand stories brands any brand i mean even if you look at hsbc a, a massive global dinosaur yeah. they were founded by somebody who had a vision and a purpose yes. and a dream and brands can tap into that equity at any point so I, there was a big conference that i did or ran or was part of for hsbc a few years ago where they told that founding story um and what and that was a quite a profound founding story about how they help people in the war and but i think you know that they're a long way on from that now but anybody starting a brand knows why they're doing it yep. and that can get lost when you feel like you have to do this you have to do that you kind of you know you've got to behave maybe like a more um kind of more grown-up company i think I would I guess it's just about somehow staying true to what you think so for me a good brand always starts the inside out always I think yep. in the old days we thought about brand being this like wrap around pretty like yeah. a visual identity that you can stick that on from the outside and then the brand carries on yep. regardless but obviously as soon as social media as soon as blogging I mean before social media people were starting to blog and post stuff then you've handed your brands in the public domain and what yeah. other people say about your brand will have infinitely more traction than what you put out as your kind of you know PR and marketing so I would always say you start from the inside out and you, you try and keep true to the founding vision and, yeah. and keep going back to what your why I mean Simon Sinek talks about the why Yes. Why? And that's what Steve Jobs did so well. You know, yep. it's all about the why, not the what. Steve Jobs never talked about a little bit of kit with all these, you know, processes in ever. Talks about, you know, I remember with the iPhone it being not the iPhone, the iPod, it being yep. a million a million songs in your back pocket. Yeah. But it's not how Samsung would have talked about it, is it? Absolutely. No, no, I I completely agree. It's a it's a brilliant book and a brilliant concept. And I I mean, just think, take it into sort of vision as, as the, the why as well. I, I'm, I'm very inspired by um, Elon Musk um, present, you know, just talking about his vision of, of of putting a community on Mars. I mean, that's that's the vision for SpaceX. It's not getting another rocket into space. It's literally that we'll be living on Mars at some point in the future. And I, I think what's really powerful for me is, I, I, although technology is advancing very fast, I doubt he believes it will be in his, his own lifetime. Um, it might be, he's probably going to live quite a long time, but, you know, to have a vision that, that exceeds our own lifetime is quite, well, an incredibly powerful thing, in my opinion. Yeah, it is. It is, but the vision will dry, you know, the more he yeah. he has that kind of clarity. I mean, that's, I learned that from, the, the, there's a man called Gary Withers who owns Imagination, and it's a privately owned company. It was a big company when I was there over the kind of millennium years, and he 
really had this way of looking at things. There, I mean, there, there are books written about these men, him, Branson, Elon Musk, that have got a similar way of looking at things. Yes. And he really, I really, that my way of thinking about it was that he was at A and he saw Z. Always, he saw yep. that. And even if the brief or the client's need was at G or H, he saw Z. And so he would go back with a solution for Z. And because he could see it so clearly, you, you get there. I mean, yep. if you can see it, you'll get there. If you can't yep. see it, you're not going to get there. And people have often said to me, but what if, what if I can't? I'm like, well, well what if you can't? I mean, but you will, because you'll see it. It might mean that you go around it a very different way, or it takes yeah. a lot longer than you thought, or you have to get over certain obstacles or hurdles. But in doing those, you're probably adding different layers, maybe expanding that Z or slightly tweaking the Z. But if you see Z, you'll get there. Yes. And I think that's really, I, mean, I guess that's why I'm here, isn't it? I've been interested in rebranding age since I was in my 20s. But now I'm of a credible age to be talking about rebranding age. So, but I think that, yeah, that I really loved the way that Gary Withers worked <clears throat> and I was privileged to, to work with him and yep. alongside him and to kind of have those lessons. And he also, you know, the culture imagination was, it was all about anybody can have the idea, whether you're the cleaner or you're yep. on the floor. And it was true. I mean, the cleaners weren't in meetings, but you know, anybody could have the idea. And I, that thing about doing what you're good at, I very quickly got picked out as somebody who you could drop into any meeting and I'd have value because one of my big things is having ideas, making connections, joining dots. So I loved that. And I didn't, you know, I'd love it that I'd be in the middle of writing a proposal and the phone would go, oh, can you come into this meeting about such and such? And I wouldn't have any context or background, but I really loved that way of working. And we had a bar, a wine bar. It was a wine bar in the evening, but a cafe breakfast cafe in the morning and a lunch kind of meeting place yep. for colleagues or, or clients at lunchtime and that the idea of um moving and interacting within that space and having conversations across your um you know teams was really important and it was around the time when pixar built their big news workspace and they put their like you know the really interesting things like pixar put all their toilets together in one block whereas normally people you want efficiency you want the loo yes. near at the desk you keep everybody close to the desk you put your water fountain yep. there you put the loo there nobody needs to stray <laughs> from the desk but pixar were like no we want everybody walking a significant way to the loo because they'll have conversations on the way yep. and that imagination <clears throat> we had a a big building that was kind of like two buildings. It was originally a school with a playground in the middle. And that central bit was left open like a central atrium, five right. stories high with bridges all the way across. And you did, a lot of conversations happened on those bridges. Brilliant. And it Brilliant. was, yeah, for me going in from teaching, because I went there after teaching, it was a really, it was so like re refreshing and, like exciting and you know anything could happen i loved it absolutely wonderful. loved it wonderful sounds amazing absolutely amazing you mentioned the cleaner i know it reminded me of the um the story of um obviously NASA. JFK, of yeah. NASA, you know what, what yeah. do you do and I'm, I'm putting a man on the moon in there yeah. uh, just perfect. That's, just, that's the perfect example of that isn't it of, of the yeah. vision pervading everybody and, and and everybody knowing that they're playing their part in achieving that and and, and without that clarity of vision and, and the end goal other people can't you know it's difficult for the people involved in achieving it i think that's yeah. the most important thing for me is that that you know we can have a we can have a personal vision but if we're not able to communicate to others they can't help us achieve yeah. it and it's that communication is is key yeah. isn't it alongside the the, the ability to envisage it's also the ability to communicate I, I guess that's really key yeah I think so and I think that's what Steve Jobs of course did very well didn't yes. he ran through everything and I think um that's what I would yeah I mean in terms of brand I think getting yeah having a vision it is about having a vision what is the vision and and it has to be a vision I mean it's not just yeah. a dry old bit of paper with some no on is it it's a vision that you can visualize and you can articulate and share and you keep talking about and you keep yes. out there and I think that's certainly with the work that we're doing with Gen M 
as they go into their kind of next stage of development. I mean, that's, you know, we have a vision at Prop Age about what we want this marketplace to do. Gen M have a vision about what they want the marketplace to do. And that that's the, the important piece of work getting out there. And I think we all feel that really, you know, from a brand perspective, it's a massive commercial opportunity not to, um, not to kind of, you know, um, do any disservice to women. Women are really desperate for more signposting, more um, respect, more products, more education, more services, everything. But brands just don't even kind of go there. The yeah. one, you know, I, yeah, I won't, there was a, as a brand that with a, a business model that really, you know, they have a lot of people in this age group. But yeah, they spend they spend a lot of their marketing time and focus on bringing in younger women because it's not seen as attractive. But actually, there's a massive swathe of people in the women in the forty plus space that are, you know, I mean, that we're not old and grey, and you know. So I think yeah, that the opportunity for brands to for for this to be the next market transformation, I think, is massive, and it's a purpose driven opportunity. Women want this stuff; they really want to be better served. They want to be better branded. I mean, even now, if there are products out there, they're not products that people want to buy. You know, or you look at it and you think, "Really? Is that am I there? Is that me? I don't think so." So yeah. even the stuff that might be helpful doesn't speak to them effectively. Yes. So. Uh, I think, you know, Julian Kinniston here, who runs uh, is the, the kind of founder of Prop, um, the main Prop brand strategy company, talks about, you know, how many vegans there are in the world and look at the transformation of the kind of vegan market into plant-based yep. eating that we know today. There's maybe yes. that, that market has grown from about three to eight percent in the last yep. five years. There are there's a much higher percentage of menopausal women out there and yet we're not served at all we don't have an aisle in the supermarket so i think in terms of a, a market opportunity for brands to really drive this kind of purpose-driven opportunity it's it's massive yep. and, and i think that's just that's just menopause like i said i think the age thing is a separate area and yes. um, it's really relevant i sat yep. on the board of the campaign to end loneliness at one point and that was you know, very interesting research was coming out then about um, loneliness is a bigger killer than obesity um, and smoking. Yeah. But and then loneliness maps onto, you know, anyway, people live alone much more now. So loneliness isn't just an older person's yeah. space, can start much younger. And then inevitably, even if you have had a partner at a certain point, you might lose that partner. So it starts to kind of get incrementally more... Yes. as age goes up and I think there's just some really interesting work being done around different ways of living you know different kind of communities that function in intergenerational ways but you have to revere age to get there and in countries like Okinawa of Japan this is research that I did for my master's in way back in 2000 I think um they live routinely to be over 100 yes and yeah. a lot of thinking that, well, they have a great diet, they have seed vegetables, they have a lot of fish, they don't have a lot of dairy. But actually, a lot of the research shows that they are revered more in society with every year that they age. So if you're revered with every year that you age, why, why would you die? It's like, you know, you're <laughs> always, you've always got the best to come. Yeah, yeah. More power and more respect and more everything. So... There is really a powerful driver, I think, for society to wake up and recognise that, you know, rebranding age is the way to go. Yeah. So, 100 percent. I mean, the, the more the more I'm talking to you, the more I, I get it. In all honesty, it's not. I, I, I'll be perfectly frank. It's not something I thought massively about, even though, uh, as I said before we started, I feel I'm sort of moving. I'm I'm conscious of my moving through my my different ages but um yeah no it's really interesting so so paint a picture if you would of, of, of the future what what does the future look like and, and and what do you see as the main challenges as you move forward uh i think the challenges will be to bring brands on board with this i think yeah. like i say the beauty industry is massively pivoted to looking young um there are a lot of issues around using 
um, platforms like Facebook, uh, social media to talk about health and well-being claims. You know, there are a lot of restrictions. You can't mention female anatomy on there. You can't mention specific um, health-related claims. I think a lot of these products can't actually advertise as well as they would um, where the restrictions different. So there's a lot of, um, there are challenges like that. I mean, logistical, real, um, policy-driven challenges. Um, there are there is the main challenge of getting brands to see this opportunity that I think that can be overcome for all the reasons we've talked yes. about. It's pretty obvious when you think about yeah. it. And I think just in terms of society, understanding that there's a different way to see people. Um, and it is for women. I mean, uh, Eleanor Mills, who founded Noon, which is a, an organization all about kind of midlife women, she talks and writes brilliantly about this. And they did a piece of research that talks about, you know, she always says that uh, a man age is like fine wine, but a woman like a peach, one wrinkle and you're out. <laughs> That's the difference. That's it. So um, I think it's challenging that, isn't it? And, and kind yeah. of, you know, starting. And also there's a, Cindy Gallup is a brilliant brand thinker, pro, uh, provoker, whatever. She's all over social media as, you know, kind of driving various different movements. She's very, she's an activist. And she was at an event recently where um, the, it was a, for a big department store. The beauty department said, you know, what would you, when you walk into the store, what do you want to hear? And she said, I want to hear somebody come up to me and say, Madam, how can I make you look older today? Ooh, wow. Well, very. That's clever. Very clever. Absolutely. Goodness. Yeah. Of course, the whole thing is about always looking younger and it isn't looking younger that's the issue. Having youthful energy, retaining youthful health is a very different thing. But I think being able to put your hand up proudly and say I'm 55 and, and not flinch as a woman, as opposed to people saying, I mean, people say to me, they don't even know my age, but they think I'm maybe around 50. I'm not, I'm older. And they'll say, um, oh God, if only, you know, oh, I really hope I'll look like you at 50. And I think, well, firstly, you probably won't because you kind of quite wrecked now, or, you know, you're not really looking after yourself now. But secondly, <laughs> like that's a real insult because it immediately implies that at 50, you look a certain way. There yeah, is yeah. a certain way. Age isn't chronological. And for me, you know, if you, if you, are comfortable wearing you know your fleece and your jeans to the pub at 20 then that's what you'll be happy wearing at 40 and 60 but if yeah. you're somebody who really is interested in how you look and you know your health then that's that stays the same it's not age isn't the determinant of what we look like yeah. at all it's our whole personality and people will you know some people are really always fit and healthy some people aren't it's just so I think there are some real challenges with overturning preconceptions of age and preconceptions of what we should look like and yeah. preconceptions around health as well. You know, I think you can be, I had my children in my late, mid to late forties and, um, but I've, I've not, you know, I've lost the baby weight and I'm kind of, and I guess when you talk about challenges for the future, yeah, that's my challenge. I'm bringing up two young children and I will um, always want to work, but I love what I do. So retirement yeah. isn't something that would be on my radar. Anyway, yes. my parents had their own business. It's not, there was no fixed end to that. I guess my yeah. dad still dibbles about a bit in it, even now in his 80s, people would ring him up for advice. So, you know, it's, um, but yeah, that, that, I guess for me, it's about li living what I talk about. Yes. I've got to be there for these young children. And I am determined to live to be, you know, a hundred plus. Touch really? I hope I'm not. There's a, there's a statistic and I can't remember where it comes from that says when you have a baby over 40, as a woman, when you have a baby over 40, you have a 60% higher chance of living to be a hundred. Okay. Oh, well, wow. that's interesting. really interesting. And that is really interesting again, from the kind of, you know, well, well, why is it that you've delayed aging by having children later? Because when you've had children, you age faster, the body ages faster, but then that wouldn't ring true because all the people who never have children would live longer. Right. Yeah. Um, 
so it must be something to do with the fact that you kind of live a younger life because you've got yep. young children so you're out of sync with your own peer group and you're in sync with a younger peer group yes and also you have the psychology of knowing that you want to be there for those children yep. so you do what you you kind of can to make sure that's yep. the case but it's a really interesting statistic and it says a lot about how you know that's one way of effectively pretending that somebody is younger than they are that works. There was another, you'd have heard of this experiment. I can't think of the um, scientist's name. It was a woman scientist. And I think it was in, it was, a, it was a while ago in the 90s. And she took a bunch of men in their 70s into a house that was completely, and they were quite, they were quite doddery men. They were on like walking frames. They were quite fragile. And they had carers, a lot of them. They went into the house, didn't have their carers, and the house was completely set up as if they were 40. Right. So it had the furniture, it had the TV shows, it had the music, the record player, everything that effectively took them back to their 40s. Right. And they were in there together as a peer yeah. group without their carers. All of them, all of them came out moving better, with improved mobility, with improved um, everything was changed in the way yep. that they reacted afterwards. So again, you know, there's something there about a, a kind of preconception of how I'm going to be at yep. 70 or 80 that we, I would say, no, it doesn't have to be. If we had different role models, if we had different goals, if we had different yep. conceptions, then we could be very different, but somebody has to set that agenda and yeah, say, that's... no, this is what age looks like. It doesn't look like that. It looks like this. Yeah. And, I, you know, for, for me, I mean, Davina McCall is obviously a big face of, um, you know, the kind of menopause yes. movement. And there are others. Um, it's a, it's, we need those role models. We need people to shake it up a bit and say, hang on a minute, this is what 50-odd looks like. I know we're not all Davina McCall with her kind of, you know, um, capacity maybe to access everything that she can but she you know she works hard and she's she's proving that you know age yes. you know it isn't it isn't the the thing itself it's about lifestyle yeah yeah, yeah I, 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 yes no, that, that makes a lot of sense I, I i often wonder with people um you know talking about my age group people are talking about being feeling old or getting old or whatever or older and I don't, I don't particularly feel like that. I'm conscious that my joints don't work like they used to, and I can't, I'm not as flexible as I used to be, but I could change, I can change that. I'm trying to change that myself, but, but that's, that, that's an aging, you know, that's it, it clearly directly related to age, but it doesn't need to affect anything fundamentally about how we are or who we are or. Um, no, and I also think the more you hear that, People who talk all the time about being old, feeling yeah. old, do age faster. Yes. And that's it's hard, isn't it? Because that's a bit in your kind of blueprint of how you were brought up. Um, if you've been in a family where that you know somebody's been getting old since they were in their fifties, then you know that's what you tend to think. And I see that in my family a little bit of difference in my parents. But I think. Um, we have to change that and that will change as society changes because you know it just means that maybe you have to do things a bit differently to ensure that you do stay flexible or you know whatever yeah. it might be there's a really i listen to a lot of podcasts in this area and there's one an american one that i love um called feisty menopause which is was started by quite an extreme athlete uh, but there was a brain uh, scientist on there recently who's, she, who's much younger she's only in her 30s it is astonishing. She's talking about the aging brain and tackling, I mean, it's just incredible stuff about, I mean, it's new research all the time coming out post kind of 2016, 2019 now, um, but looking at the fact that you can physically uh, grow, we can't grow neurons, but we can grow connections in age. You can physically restructure your brain with what you eat, how you sleep and how you exercise. So really interesting things in there like you might have a genetic predisposition to alzheimer's and there's going to be more and more of a call to action on that that people yeah. should know but even with that genetic predisposition she argues that it only affects 10 percent. so 90 percent of your like going at the speed of which you might arrive at that is is also lifestyle 
yeah. you know, how you, so that's just astonishing, astonishing new research that shows that, you know, we, we automatically assume as we're going to have an aging population, we're going to have much more, um, you know, much more of that, and we will, I mean, that McKinsey report is talking about that, but there's also, thank goodness, new research coming out showing what you can do. And I mean, I just kind of read out a few of those things to my mum. She was like, oh my God, you know, I'm on it. My mum's 82. She is well, but she definitely has a bit of that, well, what do you expect? Well, I'm in my 80s, you know. Whereas I'm, I kind of think, yeah, but this is, you know, now, and some, some of the things are really simple, like throwing a tennis ball against the wall and catching it. Yep. There are exercises, so it's not all about Sudoku or the kind of crossword puzzles that people yes. talk about. She's introducing other things into the mix that just work in a slightly different way, yep. but not complicated things. And the really, really powerful thing for me, because with young children, it's a given that you don't get much sleep, ever. <laughs> especially in like, you know, 40 degree temperatures. <laughs> but she... They took a bunch of people and reduced their sleep to six hours a night. I'm if I get six hours a night, I feel you know blessed. But anyway, six hours a night of sleep, and those people had a massive um, drop off in genes. The genes that went were um, the genes that mitigate against tumor growth, and the genes that build immunity. So reducing sleep for people who would normally get more to only six hours a night meant that immediately they were less immune and they were more right. likely to grow tumours. That's just astonishing. Yeah. Astonishing. Because, I mean, yeah. sleep is, there's that very good book on sleep. By, is it Matthew Walker? And he talks about sleep being, it will be the next big prescribed thing from the yes. NHS. Because, you know, it's free. I think I've heard him on a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah he's, he's very, he's a good person to get on a podcast. He's very good. Yes, that would be yeah. good. Yeah, I haven't yeah. thought of that. I, I think he was the guy, because um, I did, I, I'm not using it at the moment, but using a gravity blanket, which I think has really helped. Mm. Um, yeah, he did talk about that. That's right. He yeah, that's quite an interesting exercise. Not, not, not for the middle of summer, that's for sure. But, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but fascinating. Goodness, well, there's so, so, I mean, it's what a topic to um, to, 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 to have, uh, have talked to you about. So where, where just, if, if people want to know a little bit more about this topic in general, where could they look? And, and if they want to know a little bit more about what you guys are, are doing, where, where, where could we find more information about that, Claire? Uh, well, yeah, the topic in general, gosh, I mean, there's a lot going on on, I guess, any social media now with reference yeah. to menopause. Uh, positive aging. I'm on LinkedIn, post on LinkedIn quite often. Gen M, who are our client, are on yep. LinkedIn um, and on social media. Um, there are websites, of course, for Gen M and Propaganda. Um, for me, yeah, anybody who wants to contact me can contact me here at Propaganda Agency. And I would love to talk more about this. I think it's a move. Yeah. It is a movement that will yeah. not result on us just sitting here working for clients who are interested in this. It needs us yeah. to be going out and talking to clients, yeah. brands, people who are not interested in this to get them interested. So I think, yeah, I'd love to speak to anybody who's interested in having a conversation or, you know, um, yeah, just who wants to find out a bit, a bit more. Yeah. Well, Claire, it's been really fascinating. I mean, I could really talk or listen to, to you talk and, and, and talk with you for hours. But um, thank you so much for your time today. And um, yeah, it'd be really interesting, actually. I'd really like to maybe swing by in, in 12 months and just see how things are developing um, yeah. in this space because it's it certainly, you know, made me think a lot. And I'll, I'll will now be looking out as I live my life about, about information that's available to me and, and that affects me directly. Yeah, good, because there's lots, lots you can do. Yes, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for the opportunity. Nice to talk. Thanks.